we believe that this message will be a blessing to you so I want you to stay glued and watch to the end and share to bless others this is Christocentric we have a lot of Apostle Eric Nyamiche's message on our platform kindly check them out thank you for watching stay blessed I want to ask this question if the church is not made the seat of power then it is not an equipping center Will it be true or false? If the church is not made, the topic is that the church is the equipping center. But I'm saying that if the church is not made the seat of power, then it cannot be an equipping center. Would that be correct? Yeah, so potentially the church is supposed to be the equipping center. And I'm saying that it is a seat of power. Just as I cry, a seat of power. But we have to make it, create that environment so we can participate with the divine. In that atmosphere, deliverers are birth in the church. People come and there's clear transformation. There is the mystic, the unexpected happens. People are transformed. They go out there and then they transform their world. Have I communicated? Yeah, so we want to continue. So people come to church as alcoholics. They come as drunkards, born again, drug addicts. Yet they are carriers of solutions of the problems of our world. Let me say that again. People come to church as drunkards and alcoholics. But they are careers of solutions for our world. The church has a responsibility of transforming them into apostles, prophets, deliverers, and saviors of our spheres of society. The church needs to be intentional about equipping them to possess their spheres through good teachings and the endowment of the power of the Holy Ghost. I said through what? Good teachings. Now, when you are coming to church, you must come as a general. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You must come as a general. Mm -hmm. Come as a general. Come as a general. Don't just be casual. Some people don't fear preaching, and I fear them. I fear them. <laughs> I've seen certain people, we have put them on speaker's plan, maybe big meetings. But when you see their face, there is, there is no fear in their face. I mean, the way I fear preaching, not that I've not prepared, but I have to look into my nose. Then I told myself, hey, Rakabna, you have to sleep a bit. And Rakabna will sleep. Then I imagine myself, me alone here, everybody listening to me. So you... I fear it. What I don't want to do is to preach. I fear it. I only preach because it's the power of God that transforms people. We must come as a general. You must be well equipped to be able to equip people. So please, please, let's take the advice that Makion gave so that we will be well equipped. So now let's move to the teaching ministry of the church. The teaching ministry of the church. Let's go to Isaiah again. Isaiah, back to the Old Testament. Isaiah chapter 2, verse 1 to 4. Now, this Isaiah chapter 2, 1 to 4 is parallel to Micah chapter 4, verse 1 to 3. It is as if the same words have been repeated. But of course, they live in the same era. They were contemporaries. Uh, maybe they had the same burden or they received the same message from the Almighty God. But let us read the one in Isaiah. Shall we read together? This is what Isaiah, son of Amal, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Verse, next verse. In the last days, the mountain of the lost temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills, and all nations will stream to it. Verse 3. Many people will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, 
the temple of the God of Jacob. He would teach us his ways so that we may walk in his path. The law will go out of Zion. The word of the Lord from Zion or Jerusalem. Now, so we're going to read this again. There are certain things that have to be lifted from this passage. Let's go back to verse 1. This is what Azar, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. But these two names, the Judah as a nation and Jerusalem as the capital, I said Zion can stand in for both. Huh? I said Zion can stand in for both. It's like saying Ghana, Accra can stand in for both. The next verse. Then he says that in the last days, the mount of the Lord's temple, it means that Isaiah was prophesying beyond his horizon. The Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. So we have the mount of the Lord's temple will be established at the highest of the mountains. So there are other mountains, but the mount of the Lord's temple is going to be established as the highest. It will be exalted above the hills. Now, once it is exalted, the other mountains is going to look like hills. And all nations will stream to it. They will stream to the temple of the Lord. Now, the next verse. Many peoples. So, this peoples is referring to nations will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his path the law will go out from where zion and the word of the lord from jerusalem now so i'm lifting some few things out today isaiah's prophecy expresses hope for the exaltation of mount zion over all the other surrounding hills two since mount zion represents the church as an institution. The reference to surrounding hills also refers to any other human or political powers of society. This is a statement I'm trying to make now. It also depicts that the church is the most powerful institution on earth because it is exalted among the hills. And why is it the most powerful institution exalted among the hills? Why is the church the most important institution? That is the most powerful institution. What makes the church the most powerful institution? We just want to take the Isaiah. Why is it the most powerful? It is powerful because the nations are going there to receive from there. But why is the church the most powerful institution? Isaiah chapter 12, verse 6. So let's read Isaiah 12, verse 6. Why is the church the most important institution? Shall we read together? Shout aloud and sing for joy, people of Zion. We can simply say people of the church. For great is the Holy One of Israel among you. Yeah. This is the only reason why the church is the most important and the most powerful institution. Because in the midst of the church, the Holy One of Israel is amongst us. The Holy One of Israel is among us, and he is great. Now, human societies certainly will undergo positive changes as people conform to God's revelation and follow his ways. It will. When the nations come to the church, for the church to teach the nations, it will undergo transformation. We saw from Isaiah that the peoples of the world are going to Zion for them to be taught. Why is it so? Isaiah 59. Isaiah 59 from verse 14. Isaiah 59 from verse 14. So justice is driven back and righteousness stands at a distance. Truth has stumbled in the streets. Honesty cannot be found. This is what is in the world. Verse 15. Truth is nowhere to be found. 
And whoever shuns evil becomes a prey. When you shun evil at your workplace, and the people know that you are not following the corruption, you become a prey. The Lord looked and was displeased that there was no justice. 16. He saw that there was no one. He was appalled that there was no one to intervene. So his own arm achieved salvation for him, and his own righteousness sustained him. Verse 17. He put on righteousness as his breastplate and the helmet of salvation on his head. He put on the garment of vengeance and wrapped himself in zeal as a cloak. Now, so hold on to this. Isaiah is saying that there's no truth out there. There's no honesty out there. But let us look at Zion, the church. 1 Timothy 3, 15. 1 Timothy 3, 15. Shall we read together? If I am delayed, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is Zion, the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of truth. So whereas there is no truth in the world, the church is a pillar and foundation of the truth. That is why all institutions will want to go there for the truth. Because it is the truth that also liberates. So the church is the pillar and foundation of the truth. So the church cannot possibly disappoint the world. If truth is not out there, truth must be here. And from here we must teach the truth. And then once we have taught the truth, our members will go and be planted in the world with truth. And change their spheres. Are we together? Fine. They will change their spheres with the truth. They will change their spheres with the truth. Now, let me make this statement. As pillars uphold the weight of an edifice to which it is attached, like these pillars, they hold the weight of the edifice to which it is attached. So is society upheld by the truth of the kingdom which is resident in the church. So the whole society, it is upheld by pillars, the truth. So if you take this building for Ghana, the pillars are the church. It must uphold the nation in prosperity. Once the pillars collapse, the whole institutions will collapse. You see, sometimes people will say that why is America, they don't know God, why are they prospering? Their society is founded on the truth. And the principles of the kingdom is working in the society. You see, they are moving away from God gradually, but their forebears founded their society on the principles of the kingdom of God. And it's upholding their society. Now that they are moving away gradually, the pillars will be cracking. The pillars will be cracking. Pillars uphold the weight of the edifice to which it is attached. Is that true? Yes. So is society upheld by the truth of the kingdom, which is resident in the church. Mm. Hebrews chapter 1, from verse 1 to 3. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophet at many times and in various what ways. Now verse 2. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, S. Capita, whom he appointed heir of how many things? All things. And through whom also he made the universe. To the extent that if God made the universe, everything concerning Ghana concerns him. Now, the big one, verse 3. Let's read together. The sun in the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. Ah, sustaining how many things? All things by heart. His powerful word. Yeah. All things are sustained by the pillars of his word. The truth. The sun is the truth. I am the truth. Sanctify them. Sanctify Ghana by the truth. Sanctify Benin by the truth. 
And everything is sustained by his powerful word, the truth. Sustaining all things, marriages, whatever. The economy can be sustained by the truth. Yeah. By the truth. If the church fails in the discharge of the truth, the pillars will collapse. And consequently, the moral fabric of the society also collapses. Every sphere of life will be experiencing destruction. Even the economy will be affected. It behoves the church to equip her members with the truth, who will in turn affect the society with the same to transform and bring progress. Now, it is for this responsibility that Zion is equipped with apostles, with prophets, with evangelists, with pastors and teachers, so that they will in turn equip the church to serve the society. Is that also correct? Fine. These gifts of men, that is the apostles, prophets of the church, should rise up to responsibility. Brothers, let us rise up to responsibility. Now, in the Church of Pentecost, we want all our ministers as much as possible to be full-timers. So, we are kind of paying you to read the Bible and pray every day. Yeah. So, be equipped in the way. Don't joke with this responsibility. Peter says, we will give ourselves to two things. To the ministry of the word and to the ministry of prayer. We will give ourselves to that. So, if you are apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, please be equipped with the word. These gifts of men are supposed to equip because they will equip us and unleash us into the world. Let's go to the form of teaching. The form of teaching. So, we are now saying that we have to teach, we have to preach well. But let's listen to the Apostle Paul from Romans chapter 6, 17 and 18. Let's take it from the King James first. But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin. You were. Now he's talking, this is a congregational letter. If you like, a congregational teaching. But ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you that form of doctrine which was delivered to you the next verse the next verse says that being then made free from sin you have become servants of righteousness so let's go back to verse 17 but tongue but God be tongued <laughs> this is King James that you were the servants of sin. And he designed a certain form of teaching for them. He designed a certain form of teaching for them. And that teaching has changed their lives. That you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you. Verse 18 says what? Being then made free from sin, you have become the servant of righteousness. So, the Apostle Paul, we are not just teaching. We want to teach for resource. We are not just teaching. So we must design a certain pattern of teaching. Pattern of teaching. When we want to possess nations and we want to achieve our goals, we must design a certain form of teaching. Let's take it from the NIV. But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching. You see, he didn't say the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance verse 18 you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness so I'm saying that we need to develop a pattern of teaching 
that will save people and then help us to get to where we want to go to. So it is not too good for us when we have all decided that in 2022, we want to equip the church as an army. And so we want to design a certain form of teaching to be able to get to that goal. And then we come to your place and you are doing something else. You are not helping us to get to our goal. So Paul is saying that I designed a certain form of teaching. And you responded to it. And you have been delivered. If you read the whole of chapter 6, you see he was using the metaphor of the baptism and slavery and all that to bring the people to himself. And he says that this one, I intentionally designed it. There are other forms of teaching that he designed, like edification. Some of them is like um, exhortation and all that. But we need to design a certain form of teaching. From the above explanation, we want to say that Paul deliberately prepared his teaching materials, bearing in mind the issues affecting the growth and well-being of the congregation. This means that we do not just teach for teaching's sake. Teaching should be purposive. What did I say? Teaching should be purposive because you want a certain target should be purposive. Isaiah chapter 55 from verse 9 to 11. And so let's read. So as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Yeah, that is God for you. The next verse as the rain and the come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bad and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater. Verse 11, the big one. So is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but it will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which it is sent. Nobody should go to church on a Sunday morning to go and play. Yeah. Go with a purpose. Go with a purpose. You can decide that this evening it is prayer time. Or this Sunday morning it is Holy Spirit baptism. So when you know the purpose, you don't waste time on other things. We designed the service to achieve a name. This is God. And if we are the children of God, we must always speak on purpose. We must preach on purpose. So Paul says that I design a certain form of teaching for you. Are we together? Fine. Will I be correct if I say it is obvious from the discussion that the pulpit makes the pew. The pulpit makes the pew. Garbage in, garbage out. What you sow, you will reap. There's no need to come complaining that these days there are no gifts in the church. Who should put the gifts there? If you want the gift of God to be in your church, teach about the giftings. Yeah. Teach. And then ask people to come and prophesy. When someone is shouting here, others is shouting there, and you are counting. First person has counted prophesy. Microphone, microphone. Let the person finish crying. Let the person say what she wants to say because you are training them. Take 10 prophecies, 10 of them. If you like, take 20. Somebody said the Bible says take three, take 20. Because you are teaching them how to prophesy. Take 20. <laughs> Teach them. Teach them how to prophesy. Because you want to achieve something. I thought the Bible says that faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. People will always respond to the pulpit. So let us watch what we teach from here. We must design a certain form of teaching. Now, our songs, our prayers should be designed to that form. Listen to this song. 
our songs, our prayers should be designed to have that kind of effect. You see, the Apostle Paul, when you listen to his prayer, it's as if he is teaching them that your eyes of understanding be enlightened. When people are asleep, let's say the IMD is sleeping, and there is my member, Apostle Paul, oh God, that his eyes of understanding be enlightened, that you know the hope to which you have called him. Now, he will teach him this from the pulpit, and he will pray for him, same. Pray for him, same. When he is asleep, pray for him when he is asleep. But you see, all this teaching must be wrapped in the power of the Holy Ghost. It must be put in a certain setting where God himself will encounter his people. I try to keep my friends, especially those who I was elders together with, the people who really call me Brian Eric, they are the people I keep to. Mm. Brian Eric. I like those people. Because those people who call you Brian Eric, it means they really, they know you. And there's difference between the people who call you chairman and then people who say Brian Eric. Then there's, hey, chairman. Or Pastor Eric, say chairman. I keep to them. One day I went to one of them. I was in his house. When I was somewhere, maybe at in Sabah or somewhere and then he was saying that oh eh, the pastor when he comes to church his notebook is like this and he will be pages pages but I don't know papa but the notebook at his say say his notebook and then the pastor will be teaching hours of hours. And then he compared his pastor to one of the apostles who have lived in the area. And he said, it's not like this man's. When he's preaching, you can feel that the word is entering your bones. Now, listen. Listen, please. We can have many doctors in the church, but the church can grow sicker and sicker. Let our pastors wrap what they have, their doctors, wrap what you have in the power of the Spirit. It is still true today. It is still true. This is not an ancient message. It is true today. I cannot be somebody who has not studied. I'm teaching. But I know that what our father said, it is still today. It is still true today. Yeah, we can have many people. We can now that we are teaching our people. We want to have theologians in our church. That is why everyone who is coming to ministry now is registered as a BA student, BA theology. We want to pay for that one, so that we can have a lot of you sharp, sharp. But see, at the end of the day, it is a spirit that gives life. It is the spirit that gives life. And this is not my word. This is Bible. See, when Jesus was about to go, he says, I have so many things that I want to tell you, but you cannot receive it. But when he, when the spirit comes, do, 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 do. when the spirit comes, do, do, do. That's a home, home, the bar. Yeah. so we, we have to have good teaching in the church, but it must be wrapped in the power of the spirit. It must be wrapped in the power of the Spirit. It is so beautiful to see somebody who knows Scripture, great theologian, like Chamopokuina, wrapping the, the word in the Spirit. Otherwise, the letter kills. This was spoken by Apostle Paul himself, great intellectual. So it is still true that it is not momentum. It is still true. And I'm not daft to Numanim. Yeah. I'm not daft to Numanim at all. That one. I am not. I don't have many medals, but I'm not a barbarian. <laughs> yeah, so far as some of these things are concerned, but it is too true. When we were in the Bible school those days, I realized that I was backsliding. I realized that I didn't have weight. 
the weight I came from Kumasi to the Bible school is going down. But they were pumping our hands with Ecclesia, homiletics, and all these things. And then, when they say Ecclesia, homiletics, when they start explaining it now, say, ah, it's the same thing. But listen, please, I'm not playing down on education. Not at all. Please forgive me. I'm not doing that. But I still want to stand by my word that it is not about the letter. It is not about it. It doesn't change anybody. It doesn't change anybody. So we must wrap it in the power of the word. We must wrap it in the power of the word. We must put God in the center of the teaching ministry of the church. you to be studying as for that one please study but word without the spirit is just a letter that kills why did Moses go on to Mount Sinai why did he go there to receive the law that is why Isaiah is saying that the law will go out of where Zion so just as Moses went to Sinai to receive the law so the people go to Zion to receive the word. They go to Zion to receive the word. So in the church, the word must go out of the church, the truth. So when you are reading it, read it with this understanding. So let's move on to putting God in the center of the message. The Christian worker has to be a sacred go-between. The Christian work has to be a sacred go between. He must be so closely identified with the Lord and the reality of his redemption that Christ can continually bring his creating life through him. So, the Christian worker, you must be a go between, if you like, we call that betweener, between God and your hearers circuit go between so that God can bring his creative life through you into your hearers have I communicated so anytime that you stand up just bless God that you are a go between but you must be a sacred go between another point that I want to raise here which is also not in there he must endeavor to live in such harmony with God that as he ministers, God can create in his audience those things which he, God alone, can do. He must endeavor to live in such harmony with God that as he ministers, God can create in his audience those who are hearing him, those things which he, God alone, can do. Now, the founder of the church is purported to have said, now this is what 
Let us all read. Well, my friends, I did not think I preached very well. I have only three messages. One, Jesus Christ and him crucified. Two, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Three, the power of God to change lives and bring holiness in the church. Three messages. He doesn't have plenty. <laughs> Three. <laughs> Let's move on. I never used notes. This is an ancient... I mean, those days they didn't use notes. I never used notes. Doesn't mean... Today if you say you don't use notes, the children will look at you like that. But you see, what they want is the effect. <laughs> we went to a certain school. I will come back to my camera. When we were boys, we were going to preach at a certain secondary school. Then before we said, Jack, this young man came, he said he wants to join us from town, from Tema Secondary School, but he came from town. And then our leader knew him, and he said we should allow this young man to preach. Oh, so we were a bit not too happy, but the leader said he should preach. Now, when he came, we were conversing with him and we're using English, but he couldn't string his sentences together well. And then we're going to preach in a secondary school. And he says, he should go and preach. So reluctantly, we allowed him to go and preach. So but when he started, his first sentence was, was not too correct. The following one, too, was not too correct. The third one was not too correct. But the amazement was that the people were not ridiculing him. And before we could say Jack, people were shouting and crying and were falling down. That day, those of us who argued that this boy cannot speak good English, we were ashamed. The guy was causing effect. He was causing effect. The man says that I don't use, I don't have notes. What does he have? I pray until the sermon is written on my heart. And then my words bring conviction on, of sin and change life. In Smakion. Just as the founder imitated Christ and invoked God in his teaching ministry, we should also see to it that we put God at the center of our teaching ministry in our congregations, we should always remember that we are not competent in ourselves to claim anything as coming from us, but our competency is from God, who has made us qualified to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. We should demonstrate in our teaching the power and presence of God in our midst. When people experience God through our teaching ministry, they become fully aware of the power of God in our lives. Now, I want to make this statement. It is dear to me. Please, let's pay attention. Prayer within the content of the message testifies that the teacher believes and submits to God. Not prayer within the context. Prayer within the content of the message. As the message is going, it is accompanied. Prayer is inside. Yeah. Prayer within the content of the message. Now, most of you are far away from me. What you hear is my words. But if I don't have energy, I can't throw these words. If you bring your hand close to my mouth, you will see that it is not only words that are coming out of my mouth, but breath is accompanying it. It is my breath that is throwing the word like that. If I don't have breath, my word, despite this one, you still will not hear. Because there must be prayer in the content of the message. The content of the message. Through prayers, God's empowering presence is invoked for the benefit of the recipients. See, Paul Scott Wilson said this. He was a theologian. He says that this is what he said. 
Prayer is an elevated form of teaching. <laughs> you can argue with it. You can argue with it. Prayer is an elevated form of teaching. But he was a theologian. Now, Jesus' message were characterized by such conviction which could be attributed only to the fullness of the Spirit of God upon his life. No. Scripture says, people were amazed at the gracious words that came out of his mouth. Luke chapter 4, verse 22. I like this particular text. Some of you who have been following us know that we have been using this text often enough. But let's read together. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son, they asked, words full of grace coming out of his lips. Others were also amazed. Mark 1, 22. Let's read Mark 1, 22. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had what? Authority. And then they didn't end their comma, not as the teachers of the law. They have known the teachers of the law. Da, 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 da. They hear them and they are sleeping. But this young man came. He said, he taught with such authority. We can attribute it to his fullness of spirit. John 4, 41. This is the testimony from those from Samaria. John 4, 41. And because of his words, many more became believers. There was something about his words to the extent that Peter said, I've worked all night, but because of your words, when I was hearing you, because of his words. Now, the disciples on the way to Emmaus, they knew that it was Christ, their master, because of the words. Something happened to them. Luke 24, 3-2. So let's read. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? For them, this is the proof that they met Jesus. And they are disciples. So it is phenomenal of Jesus. When he's speaking, something works on your inside. There was something about his words. Something about his words. So this gives the hint that it is the man behind the message who defines the message. It is the man behind the message who defines the message. The minister's whole life is behind this, his ministry. As the life giving milk from the mother's breast is but the mother's life, so it is with the ministry. It is impregnated with the minister's life. The minister's spiritual life is in the ministry's an art flow of life. The art flow of divine life through mortal vessels. The ministry grows because the man grows. The ministry is powerful because the minister is full of power. The ministry is holy because the minister is holy. His sermon and ministry is full of divine unction because the minister is full of divine unction. The ministry cannot rise in its life-giving force above the minister. See, the problem we have is not because the devil is too powerful. It's just about the strength of the minister. Now, to just conclude this portion, I want us to go to my friend, Oswald Chambers. Oswald Chambers, when he died, people gave testimony concerning him. Others who gave testimony concerning him in different times. This one, J.E. Fisson, an Anglican bishop, gave a testimony concerning him. Oswald Chambers lived in his Bible. 
reading and studying it constantly. He was also a man of ceaseless prayer. Another person who knew Chambers also wrote, let's read this one. To hear him pray was to be in the presence of God. He seemed to live in uninterrupted communion with God. Another person also described him this way. Truly, it is this one that I like. The persuasive power and influence of the Holy Spirit rested upon his works. And we must all desire this, that the persuasive power of God must rest upon our works. When you are a minister, God should be able to persuade people. It must rest upon us. There was no excitement. The meetings were quiet. And the mighty power of the Holy Ghost was manifested in every service. Because it was constantly the same. Another person described him as this. I shall never forget the atmosphere of the first meeting, a devotional one. As one entered the room, it was like stepping into heaven. Hmm. Because one person is coming. He is so prepared. Somebody said something about Billy Graham that really touched me. Because after he has finished preaching during his time, he would just fold his arms like this. And then sometimes you can sing softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. And people will be trooping. And then when he died, someone was giving a testimony about him. And then he said one day, they were about to begin a crusade. He was part of his team. And then there was, something went amiss, which he had to communicate to Billy Graham. And so he went to the wife, whether he could see Billy. And the wife said, oh, at this, around this time, I'm sorry. She said, but this one will need his attention. So I'm sorry, you can't get him around this time. So you see, this one will need his attention. Then the woman said, tell me. So when he said it to the woman, the woman realized that this one, it may need the husband's attention. But she knew where the husband was. But he was not willing to take the man. <laughs> but somehow... He said, okay, come. Then he opened this door. And the man said, I saw this huge giant of a man prostrating on the floor and sobbing like a baby. So when he folded his arms like this and he said softly and tenderly, Jesus is coming, the people were coming. Not that he was a good preacher. He has warned the people on his knees. How can somebody like him keep to such integrity for all these years? He was constantly the same before God. If our ministry changes, we shall change this church and we shall change the world. It is the pulpit that makes the pew and the pew will make the world. The possessing the nations depends on us. If we desire, God desires. Let's go back to my friend Chambers. I shall never forget the atmosphere of the first meeting, a devotional one. As one entered the room, it was like stepping into heaven. This atmosphere must be prepared. Zion. Another person also testified about him. Mr. Chambers spoke, leading us to God. And I afterwards found that this was characteristics of him. In every lecture or meeting, he brought one right into the presence of God. Another person said this about him. This is also Chambers, my friend. He died too early. He was just about 43 years when he passed. The salient thing in my memory of that mission is the way in which they emerge all the time and every time. Chambers' own personal, passionate devotion to Jesus Christ that 
and the strange way in which his own self was absent when he's preaching. Indeed, that was one of the strangest things about his personality. He inwardly was so intensely there and yet so absolutely out absent. There was no self to consider. Let me end by just quickly going to the section nine. We must measure our progress. If we are actually teaching in certain ways to achieve certain results, then we must measure our progress. Try and measure our progress. Don't wait till the GS asks us for the report and then write something for us. Measure your progress. Our measure of the growth of our members should not only be statistical, numerical facts or data. How many? How many? How many? Should not only be how many. It's not only numerical figures or values, mathematics. Our members as our apprentices, we need to examine their spiritual and moral development as we observe closely how they are responding to the form of teaching we are giving them. Every member is an apprentice of us. We need to follow closely how they are progressing, how it is transforming them, and the impact they are making as apprentices in their spheres of influence. See, one day when Jesus came up from the mountain of transfiguration, and then he met this man who has brought his son to uh, the rest of the disciples to cast out the demon from him and they couldn't. The man says, and they could not. He says, how long should I be with you? He expressed his frustration. He realized that at least they should be getting somewhere. But once upon a time, when the disciples came back and said, even demons obeyed us, Jesus couldn't hide his excitement. He said, I saw Satan fall like lightning. Let us measure our progress. Open your eyes and see where you are leading them to. Whether they are conforming to the pattern of teaching. Whether they are being transformed. Whether they are having positive effect in their spheres. I want to invite Apostle Etru to be going to Carnation Market to go and see whether the women are affecting their community. Come and call me and we'll go there. Yeah. We have stayed in our rooms too much. We have been too area heads. Hmm? Even the way we greet area heads greeting. Area head is in, always in a big box. The people don't even see you in their house. Always in a big box, big car. Jump. Shoot, shine. A nice shine. In Futrubia morning now, Uncle Jum, area head. Measure the progress. If you want to measure progress, follow people to their workplace. See what is happening. When we do this, our pastors will roll up their sleeves. We are not just supervisors, we shall also give an account. Let's measure the progress so that it is not only statistics. How many members? How many? How many? How many? Beyond the how many, let's see the value of what is going on. So may the Lord bless us and may you quicken every one of us. May you open our eyes of understanding to behold what we have.